let's go to the Newfoundland position here. What, what happened from your point of view? What happened was that the afternoon of the 4th, when there were no, was no meetings, we had come out of a meeting that morning where the Prime Minister had said, well, doesn't look like there's a deal here, and uh, I guess we'll all have to go home and announce failure, and we'll do perhaps, or I will attempt to do a patriation and uh, get into some referendums as it relates to amending formula and the Charter over the next couple of years. A lot of people view that as being the real motivation for us that afternoon and for getting the agreement. I don't agree with that. It did assist, but the confluence of events had already occurred even before he said that. All of the various groups around the country were mobilized. There was a, comp a feeling by everybody that we had to craft something. We had to do the patriation for sure, and how much else we crafted will depend upon, you know, the negotiations. Uh, so, but that was the sequence of events. So that afternoon, uh, I wrote down on a piece of paper, which later got typed up, the amending formula uh, the, the Prime Minister was moving on. That's where the problem was with the Feds. Uh, the Charter, the provinces who were most strongly opposed to any Charter were starting to move a little bit. So I wrote those two things down. I was going to present them as the two ideas on which we could build something that afternoon because we were tentatively going to have a meeting. We loosely said, let's try to get together now as a result of nothing on this afternoon to see what we can do about where we are. That meeting didn't, didn't occur. Later on in the afternoon, my, dele my delegation, uh, aware of all of this, got together uh, with my approval and started to write stuff down, the amending formula, the charter, and to define the things in the charter and the mobility rights and the other stuff that were in the federal resolution, plus the amending formula of the April Accord that the provinces had. And so when they wrote it down, handwritten by Mr. Cy Avery, my deputy minister, uh, he, they said, well, what do you think? So we had a meeting, and I said, well, you know, this is what we've been talking about, and let's go for it. Let's, let's see what we can do. So they were talking to a few of their counterparts, and uh, I had my uh, minister there who was talking to a few of his mm, counterparts. Uh, in the lobbies and one thing and another, and uh, we agreed that uh, we would go over, we were in the Four Seasons Hotel, we would go over to the Chateau to Premier Blakeney's suite on the fourth floor and meet there because Mr. Avery had a good connection with uh, BC, Alberta, and Saskatchewan to talk about these ideas. But it was an actual three-pager then that we put down as a starting point for talking about trying to do something. We all knew Quebec is not here, New Brunswick is not here, Ontario is not here. But remember, the day before we had Ontario with us to go to the Prime Minister with a proposal that he rejected. That's very, very important because, and that hasn't been released yet, this is the first time I think that anybody has said that. The provinces actually had two proposals. One that BC had worked on, that we all worked on. One that Saskatchewan had, that they had worked on, both of which got rejected. The BC one got rejected in a secret meeting with the Prime Minister, with four premiers present, our three delegation of Buchanan, Lougheed and Bennett, and, and Davis there as well. He agreed to go. I got turned down. And then the next day, when BC reneged on presenting theirs, which they had promised to do, so it would be on the record, Alberta presented theirs. Then when that failed, it was the double referendum stuff that the Prime Minister had said. Okay, so we're over at the Chateau, and we're aware all of these two things that happened, two rejections, and now the Prime Minister with his, you know, his failure thing and so on. But we were already into that mood anyway, as I say, so it wasn't just the double referendum threat that got us going. We were going anyway. We, we knew we had to try to do something. And the three other provinces knew too. So they sat down and they started to work it out. And Mr. Avery said, now if something starts to come together there, I'll let you know. I don't want you over there now. Let the bureaucrats do this. Meanwhile, I called a number of the premiers, Mr. McLean uh, and Mr. Blakeney and Mr. Buchanan, and uh, spoke to them and Mr. Bennett on the phone and told them what was going on. And some of their officials had already communicated with them. So the thing, the, the flux was on their way, okay. 
And so uh, I got a call about uh, around 10, 30 or 11 from Mr. Avery saying, we're making a lot of progress, Premier, so don't go anywhere, for God's sake. Make sure you're still in your room because I might need you a bit later on. Meanwhile, Premier Blakeney turned up at his suite, of course, where, where the uh, Saskatchewan delegates were. Uh, Mr. Buchanan turned up and Mr. McLean, because I had called them. So they just made it their business to, to, go, to go there. Some of them were staying in that hotel anyway. With their, with their officials who were already there talking to our officials. So the thing started to develop some momentum. We had three premiers there, and we had Mikkelsen there representing Premier Lahey, because Premier Lahey wanted to retire. And we had, uh, who, who else did we have there? We had uh, Mikkelsen there, and we had uh, from, uh, uh, from BC, Mr. Bennett wasn't there, so uh, Mr. Smith was there representing Mr. Bennett. Okay. So we were doing okay. That was five, and we were six. So around 12, 12.30, uh, the, everybody was coalescing around these ideas, and everybody was agreeing to them with minor uh, changes or whatever. So I get a call around 12.30 or whatever from Mr. Avery saying, get over here, Premier. I think we're going to be able to have something ready for breakfast that morning. So I take a cab from the Four Seasons, go over, get involved in the in the situation and within an hour an hour and a half we all had agreed that this should be presented at breakfast the next morning a couple of changes were made as a matter of fact i think if you look at when i released the, the full drafts which i will in my book next year uh the first that we had in there aboriginal in one of the drafts and that came out as you know this was a big big issue right and then uh, even after that it was a big issue about the wording but in any case, 90%, 85% of what we had brought to the room at the beginning with all of the talk and negotiation with everybody. And I think one of the real sad things about this is that because this, well, well I'll get into it in a few minutes. I'll finish the thing. So anyway, we retyped it again. Okay, so there's really three. The original that never got presented to anybody, which was just the two ideas of the amending formula and the charter, small charter, never went anywhere. Then the officials and myself working on a larger thing that we took to the chateau that got approved essentially with a few changes to be retyped third, number three for the breakfast meeting six hours later, six or seven hours later. So it got retyped, approval to present to the premiers the next morning. Why did we have agreement that night? Essentially. But why was it still not agreement agreement? We wanted to give Quebec a chance. And we knew Mr. Lawhey, notwithstanding Mr. Mikkelsen being there and his sidekick, you know, fixed to the hip, Mr. Lawhey wanted to see it himself, wanted to go through it himself with everybody before Alberta's approval was final. That was very important. And of course, to give uh, Manitoba, Mr. Lyon had left, so we were on to his minister, Mercier, who was on to Lyon back in Manitoba, time to sift through it and see where they were going to come out. Mercier felt that they could go along with it, although they still didn't like the charter. But, right, we, he had to wait overnight and talk to Mr. Lyon, so that was important. Uh, meanwhile, by the way, during the night, we had my minister, Ottenheimer, contact Mr. McMurtry from Ontario, who wasn't part of the Gang of Eight, to let them know what we were about. And he committed to let Premier Davis know. So we finally then get to the breakfast at 8 o'clock with the third one, or uh, amended from the night before a little bit, retyped on two pages. And I'm to present it to the group, even though most of them saw it all before, six hours before. But Mr. Lahey was there on time. Everybody was there on time except Mr. Levesque. Of course, by that time, he was aware of what was going on and uh, why he was a bit late, I guess. In any case, presented, and everybody said, we think we can, we can go with this. So Mr. Levesque turns up, as La, Mr. Lahid says, at 23 minutes later, he was late, but he sat down, and I said, now, Mr. Levesque, here is what we've been talking about. We met last night. We think it's you know, critical that we come out of these meetings with an agreement on patriation and whatever else we can agree to. Here's what we've got now in our package. And uh, he said he was very upset that we met without him. He thought we you know, breached our, our, our trust with him. 
course, he had gone along with the referendum the day before without talking to us. But nevertheless, we didn't say anything about that to him. We never got into an argument with him on that. We just passed that by. We were more interested now moving, moving the thing forward. And he said, no, he couldn't agree with these things, some of these things in, in, the, in the document. So, no, he, he wasn't going to be part of it. No, no, no. And so we agreed to go ahead with it anyway. And I would present it at the meeting. And so we go then 9 o'clock to the conference with the Prime Minister and all the Premiers. And at that conference, Levesque spoke up first after the Chairman, Mr. Trudeau, opened the meeting. By this t time, Mr. Trudeau... Now, and then, before the meeting started, there was one province still left out. That was New Brunswick. And we made sure New Brunswick knew about it and had a copy of the proposal just before the conference started, say 5 to 9, or before, yeah, right, right as the conference started, and then, of course, the chairman uh, opens the conference. Now New Brunswick knows about it. Levesque is speaking first anyway, so New Brunswick has more time to see what it was. And he tries to delay and to try to work certain things in ideas that he wanted, right? And this went on for some time, and I was getting quite agitated. As you know, it doesn't take me very much to get me agitated when I want to get on to say something. And I remember I was agitated because, you know, we hardly had any sleep. We had worked really hard on this. Uh, we were committed to it. And we had a fairly good sense that, uh, given what we knew about Davis being with the private meeting and stuff, that he quite, quite likely, you know, could be talking to the prime minister or whatever. And this, you know... This just seemed like something that was livable. Only problem, of course, was Quebec. We were swallowing on that all the way. I mean, we understood that. That was unfortunate and that it would have consequences. Uh, but nevertheless, we figured we had to come out of there with something, notwithstanding one or two provinces not being in the mix. We, that was, the, that was the, our view. So finally, Mr. Levesque, uh, had it, well, almost expired, if you will, on his talk and stuff, and I was there, signaled to the Prime Minister, and the other Premiers were getting quite upset as well. And then finally the Prime Minister looked at me and he said, Mr. Peckford, I understand you have something to present. I think that might be the exact words. And I presented it. And that, as most, some commentators will say, formed the basis. But we formed the basis. It was really the deal, the uh, the agreement, except for we added on one thing to do with the Aboriginal peoples for the you know the conferences to come up later. We changed the word from being the government of Newfoundland to the governments of all the provinces and the federal government agreeing, and we changed the unemployment to employment in the mobility section, and we changed uh, non abstanding clause to notwithstanding clause, meaning the same thing, and then we had the deal. And so through the morning. Those unemployment to employment, not abstaining and notwithstanding, got changed into the new agreement. And that's why I don't know if the Intergovernmental Affairs Secretary was there or not, because we distributed that two pager and there's nowhere to be found except the copies that we have. And I'm talking to the officials now from the federal government, Mr. Tasse and Mary Lawson. They were there to receive whatever the federal government gave them to, to phrase up for the agreement. So the first thing that they would get would be a piece of paper with unemployment being employment, with non abstaining being notwithstanding, right, on another sheet of paper. So it's quite likely that's the reason why. So I checked with the Intergovernmental Secretariat in Ottawa, and I said, you must have a copy of that two-pager that we presented, because we presented it, and everybody agrees we presented it, and you can go forward to the, uh, the final agreement, or you can come backward and both confirm each other, and the wording confirms it. So uh, both Mr. Tasse and, Mr. La and Mary Lawson say it was that morning before they received anything. So they received nothing from this alternate uh, now mythology that's out there about the so-called kitchen thing, quite likely they were meeting, but Mr. Tasse admits that there was nothing came to him from them, from Mr. Kretchen to him. It came the next morning after we got talking. So it's obvious that this flow that I'm telling you about is legitimate and has been validated by even the wording of the, of the final agreement because it's just so close. I mean, it's almost the same. So there you have it. That's 30 years in the making now. The, this rose its ugly head. Uh, well, I'm ahead of myself. After the fifth, I went home to St. John's, Newfoundland. The first couple of stories that came out 
were quite accurate. A CP story and another story. By Monday, additional stories were coming out about a kitchen or a pantry. I didn't know anything about it. My two deputy ministers didn't know anything about it. That day, Monday, I called up a reporter in St. John's and asked him to come in. He was itching to come in anyway because I was home and I was his premier. And for three or four hours, I did an interview with him going through what happened. I wanted to put something on the record. So it was a tape. He gave me a copy of the tape. I put it away. On the 12th, four days later, the two deputy ministers, seeing the news reports, now I was on about other things now, that thing was done for now until we had these other first ministers meetings on the Aboriginal stuff and on the women issue stuff, you know, for these other sections that later got added, but I was, as you know, busy man, so, but I was very upset with some of these reports that were coming out. Meanwhile, my two deputy ministers were too, so they got together and did up there chronological events and filed it away. Now several times during the period from 1981 to 1999 I did make a number of attempts in talking to different people to say I you know this this stuff that's being written in some of these books is not correct it's inaccurate it's not only inaccurate in so far as how we got the agreement and what it was based on, but to show you just how bad it is, is that they didn't have any premiers uh, in the Chateau Laurier, the night of the so-called Long Knives, which really wasn't Long Knives at all. Uh, there was no premiers, and there were four there. So, I mean, this is how bad it was. So, uh, but we, uh, my two deputy ministers, they went about their business and so on. So nobody really picked up the cudgel to, to correct this thing. And the other premiers were about their business, and I guess, uh, because it wasn't their papers that went through the system anyway. It became our paper, so everybody uh, claimed ownership of it, yeah. right? Then it just became amorphous thing and we'll see you around, Joe. 99, the National Post article by Pref Professors Cooper and Morton, came out and really, really highlighted the inaccuracies all over again and even uh, insulted Newfoundland by saying, how could Newfoundland ever be the one to put together or help craft a, a, a national unity deal or a patriation deal, which of course my two deputies read. I was in BC now, I had moved from Newfoundland to British Columbia. I read it, they read it, they, per they did two letters to the two professors, uh, chastising them for the inaccuracies, and gave them copies of the three documents, the one that never got published, the one that was for the night, the one was for the next morning, plus their, chronological, their chronology of events. It was all in the hands of these professors, which they never released. We got a written apology back from one and a, a backhanded apology for the, from the, another one, the other person, right? and said, we'll look at this material really closely, you know, sort of thing. But they never ever did anything after, at least publicly, that we are aware for on it. But it resurrected the thing. I went and found the tape. And I listened to the tape. Wow. And you know one of these tapes where the guy's talking, well, no, hold on now, Premier, say, you know, I want to go through this again. Hold on now, so, you know. So it's a very long, drawn out, really hard to read. It comes to 24 pages. I finally transcribed it. Yeah. Left it again, and had in my mind for many years that I wanted to write a book anyway about my time as Premier. And as I start researching it, I now have this big section in the book on the Constitution and having an appendix with all these documents in it that are right here on this table right here. I was preempted by this conference. I knew I didn't want to release all the documents per se, I wanted to keep them from my book, uh, the original three documents, plus the chronological event, plus the 24 page interview, but I knew I had to do something. So I did this summary, which I released last night which lays it out. Now, I wouldn't have even done that if I didn't have reconfirmation three or four times from Premier Lougheed and Premier Buchanan that this is the correct way they know what happened. 
or if I didn't get an additional confirmation, I still might have released it with Buchanan and Lahid's confirmation, because I, I know what I'm talking about. I was there, and this is all legitimate, and these other t people who did it independent of me, and I didn't even see it until 1999, mm -hmm. right? So it's all, it all works, and it is what it is. And, uh, but then when I heard these two scribes from the federal government yesterday say, and I went and questioned them, and it, it is now. And she actually told me again this morning. Yes, we didn't get anything until after the first ministers met, and then we start getting the very sections that have to be changed. You know, and a new, a brand new agreement composed to go to all of us while we were recessing. We recessed after the proposal got presented, and everybody spoke around the table, and there was general agreement. And Trudeau was there and said, well, you know, we can see. Blah, blah, blah. And finally, we had this thing, almost put to bed, except for changing unemployment to employment, changing non-abstanding to, right, to notwithstanding, and adding, right, that we needed to do more on the Aboriginal file and have these meetings and see, and then there might be something added, whatever. But, and then so we recessed while all of the delegations were doing their wordsmiths on the two pages to change these words and to add number five, or, the, or that last one. And then as we were getting agreement on them between everybody, that was going to the other scribes in the federal government to finally put into legalese, or put into the proper wording, so that we could sign an agreement. And then we came together to sign the agreement in that room, in English, and then the translators had to have some time to do it in French, and then we signed the French version to the public later that afternoon. What had happened to Mr. Levesque? Had he just gone at that point? Did he go? I don't even know if he went. I suppose he must have. I guess they just reclined, you know, re re to their af when the when the meeting broke up. I guess they went on, but I don't. I can't remember that. It was so euphoric then. Yes. But not only euphoric, uh, we were still a bit concerned about some of the wording because once you break and each, you know, the, the various delegations get together, is there going to be nah, 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 right? because we've been through this for two or three years, right? And we, so everybody had to be on their best behavior and not tied now to, to add something on. Remember when we started a few years before that, we started with 12 items in addition to patriation and charter, you know? Each province had, I had the fisheries issue that I wanted, you know, shared more shared jurisdiction over, which I had to relinquish. I didn't get, the federal government said no, all the provinces agreed, but the federal government didn't agree. So I had to give it up for the sake of the country, even though our Cod collapsed later and all the rest of it. But anyway, you know, that's part of deal making, I guess. So, uh, but there still was concern after we broke up, even though we had this general agreement, now you put it into words, right? Into final words. So, like this unemployment and employment thing, New Brunswick came up with the idea. It was New Brunswick. It was Mr. Hatfield who suddenly appeared out of nowhere uh, to, to uh, say, well, why are you putting in when you're, until you're, you, know, you can have these affirmative action programs until. Your if your unemployment rate is higher than the national average. Why don't you put in there if the empl employment rate? And so we went through a quick calculation with, with uh, our deputy minister, who was an economist, and some others, and they said, yeah, well, about the same thing. It doesn't, we, we're not going to hang up on that, you know. That's a, that's a you know, mathematical kind of thing that we can live with. That's not a big deal. It'll still mean we can do affirmative action programs until we reach a higher level of prosperity than we've got now without violating a constitution of some sort. And then uh, we were a bit concerned about uh, the wording for the notwithstanding clause and that five-year thing. And that had to be properly worded. We weren't so concerned, we weren't so concerned about the Aboriginals, Newfoundland wasn't, because we, we were quite willing to accept something in the Constitution acknowledging uh, Aboriginal uh, rights and stuff. It's just a question now, we weren't going to get that at this meeting but we needed something in there to advance it to another meeting, which the Prime Minister wanted to do too, and others did. And so it was, was you know, how, how soon, First Minister's Conference, blah, 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 can we do it? And of course, the, we wanted to make sure that wording got done and finished. But when we did uh, adjourn, we knew we only had a few hours to get this done. I mean, because now we had agreed so we could all point to one another pretty quickly. You agreed just a few minutes ago, and it didn't include this. So everybody was on pretty good behavior. And so the thing really, the, the, the deputy ministers and the other people in the room really came together. My final comment would be this. 
I guess, which really concerns me. Uh, Mr. McLean, Premier McLean of PEI and his minister, Mr. Carver, Premier Lyon of Manitoba, he went back because he was into a campaign. Well, I noticed in a paper just this morning something about putting him up there and he, he left and went home as if he was not interested. He was, ex he was eloquent as it relates to whether we should have a charter or not all through this process and including while we were there. And his minister Mercier and his people were good people. And they all had to swallow. They all had to, you know, put their principles aside and for the better good of the country. Uh, and th they were contributors. And Mr. McLean, the Premier of PEI, a, a gem of a man, wise, a wise, wise man, when he spoke two sentences, you listen, right? Because he was going to say something worthwhile. And so through our, this process that's happened, where all of this has got confused, and this business of the kitchen, which now was a sideshow to what was really going on, and what I have said uh, as well, I feel a very strong obligation to point out the importance that we all know Alberta and Saskatchewan and BC, Nova Scotia, yeah, no, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and BC started with us at the meeting that night very soon after Nova Scotia was there. And their ministers were really, really good too. I mean, they, they were part of it. Mr. Howe and, and Mr. Morris. And then Premier McLean showed up himself because I had called these premiers earlier and his, his minister. And they stayed there the whole night long and they participated all the way through all of the provisions of all of this. You know, so they were much a part of it. So it is not proper for something so significant in the history of our country not to fully recognize every single person who was involved that late afternoon, evening and night, and the next morning. And then even New Brunswick, who were, had committed themselves to Mr. Trudeau early on, so that they just allowed the federal government to go ahead and, and play their game. Ontario took a bit more of an active role by being at that private meeting that I talked about and being around a lot, McMurtry and them being around a lot. But even at the end, New Brunswick, once we came to this deal, supported it and even got involved in some of the wordsmithing of it, so even there. So we, we all played parts, but for, for the record, it, it had, and I, I'm very keen on this. I'm, I'm, as you know, I'm the aggressive one on this because this is important, not just for Newfoundland, I don't, I don't care about that so much, but for Mr. McLean and Mr. Buchanan and their officials, for Manitoba and their officials, Mr. Smith, for, for uh, there from and Mr. Bennett from from British Columbia, they all played big roles through this whole process and during that night and the next day. Tremendous. Well, that's that's quite a an interview. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.